so how we will go today is we have two presentations of around 20 minutes and where we will explore the side of the arts and the side of the science of this fantastic topic that is related with vision. Um, and formally, I want to introduce myself. My name is Christian Seltzer. I'm the founder and president of the Convergence Initiative. Uh, the Convergence Initiative, let me just share with you a little bit. Um, so, there we go. And it's not that one, one second. So the conversion is, Convergence Initiative is a Canadian nonprofit organization and we work with uh, several partners in Montreal and in Canada. We work with the Concordia University Faculty of Fine Arts, with McGill University, with the Brain Repair and Integrative Neuroscience Program of the Research Institute or the McGill University Health Center, with the Canadian Association for Neuroscience uh, and uh, with the Montreal General Hospital. And what we do is basically set these collaborations between scientists and artists to talk about science, neuroscience, and fine arts and design, to find commonalities between these two worlds and uh, learn from each other in the most horizontal way possible. So for this, we have a course that we teach every year of uh, two full semesters in Concordia University that have students from McGill and from Concordia. Uh, we also uh, develop uh, SciArt Talks where we invite speakers that work in the areas of science and art to uh, speak about their work. Um, and in part, what we are doing today is a little bit uh, that for a uh, format that we have been doing for the last four years. Convergence had five years in this moment. We also teach workshops about the, um, the crossover between science and art and science communication. And we also facilitate art residencies for uh, artists that want to work with scientists and hopefully in the future also for scientists that will want to work with artists. And one of the most exciting things that we have been doing in these uh, last two years is preparing this fantastic collaboration with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and this is basically our first uh, encounter in live with all of you invited. So we are very, very excited about today. So we have been preparing this collaboration for more than a year already. Uh, Estefan is my partner in crime in this uh, amazing work that we have been doing. Um, and uh, we have several supporters. So we have the Brain Program, as I was mentioning before, and Healthy Brain and Healthy Life, who has been supporting us with money to develop this collaboration, Concordia University, Faculty of Fine Arts, who kindly support us, allowing us to use Zoom account to hold these meetings virtually and the Canadian Station for Neuroscience who promote our talks. Uh, and our collaboration is called Parallel Worlds, Mont Parallel, and it goes from today, April 24 to August 21st. This collaboration comprise, uh, comprise a virtual tour that you can access today in the Convergence website where you can uh, find 14 different artworks that have been curated especially for their content in relation to art, technical skills in art, historical importance, and for the content that they have with science and neuroscience of vision in particular. So they have a lot of beautiful information about how your brain works. And one of the things that they do is precisely showcase how artists have been exploring for long before scientists, the way that the brain work uh, through art. So these events also include talks, the colloquiums that you will participate today. Banta Black is our first colloquium. We have named each one of them uh, reference to a color. So Banta Black is a famous pigment that is used today that is the darkest pigment in the world. But this also includes a workshop that is usually a week after the colloquium. So next week, next Saturday is a workshop that you can take, it's free. You can see for registration in the conversion website also. Um, and before, just to give a uh, word to Estefan, I just want to promote our next talk that will be in May 15th, that is called Crimson, that will be dedicated to the way that colors produce emotions and passions and things in our brains. So uh, don't miss 
this talk that will be next month, uh, you can register already in the Converses website. So that's from me. I would like to invite now Stefan to speak. Thank you, Christian. Uh, my name is Stephen Legary. I'm program officer for art therapy at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, I want to thank Christian and all of the Convergence Initiative for not only coming up with this incredible idea that I feel is a real gift to us on the art world side of things, um, but also for developing this adaptation. The original inception of this idea is that we would all be gathering in galleries right now and experiencing um, this teaching and this sharing live in front of paintings, in front of sculptures. And this team has worked incredibly hard to reimagine how they can share this information, which is their ultimate goal, through this format. Um, one of the pluses of that is that we're gathering in a much larger number right now than we would have in the galleries. Uh, so I'm particularly thrilled and excited to be a student for the next hour together. Um, the next thing I would like to do is have the great pleasure of introducing Marie-José Daou. I'm going to just take a moment to read her bio, if you'll give me permission. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the volunteer guides of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, we have an incredible team that come from such diverse backgrounds themselves in terms of their passions and their professions. Uh, and they are here because they love the collection and they love to work with people and they love to communicate the collection to groups, to individuals, to families. Um, and it's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the time that the volunteer guides have dedicated to this project as well. So without further ado, allow me to introduce Marie-José Daou, a Montrealer, trained in philosophy at the University of Montreal, Université de Montréal, at McGill, at the University of California at Berkeley, special interests in logic, the philosophy of science, and the role of philosophy in society at large. She began teaching in Montreal at Collège Awensic in 1967, which was the year that the Sejeps actually came into existence, which meant initiating a modernized approach to philosophy for everyone, and not only for those who would make a career of it. Uh, she worked as a team and experimented with a variety of pedagogical approaches and twice sat as department head over the years and uh, sat on many boards as well and committees. Under the leadership of Laurent Michel Vachy, she collaborated along with Jean Claude Marte in the publication of Débat Philosophique, une initiation, in 2002. After 36 years of teaching, she retired in 2003, and I love this word, soon to recycle herself as a volunteer guide, which we're very fortunate for. She was trained as such at Montreal, uh, excuse me, at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, where she began as a guide in 2007. So now into the 14th year of guiding. Uh, she's guided across the entirety of the museum's collections and for diversified audiences, individuals, groups, and including the visually impaired. She finds art's way of challenging our cultural presuppositions to be most nourishing indeed. Marie-Josée, I'll invite you to unmute. And we'll now go through the little dance of sharing oh. screen and you okay. can take it away. So I, oof, I'm nervous, everybody. <laughs> We're here with you. Okay, well, uh, I partage l'écran. Partage l'écran. And then I do partage l'écran again. Yes, yes. And, and we're off. Okay, I don't want to see myself. There we go. Okay, uh, well, ooh, um, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here to guide you on a tour, as it were, uh, of three works, not many. Uh, and before starting, I just want to stress one thing. Uh, viewing a work of art, because I organized everything on viewing a work of art. Viewing a work of art is, uh, is a very personal thing. You all know that two different persons can react very differently to uh, all sorts of, very differently to the same work. This is typical of art. Art is an open territory where we can exchange points of views. When I do this with, uh, the guy, with visitors, I try to go beyond the first glance, which is always very fast. I try to go beyond the first glance, and then we exchange 
on our uh, on, on on the different uh, uh, impressions that we get from the work. This will be perhaps difficult to do right here on the spot. So I'm sort of turning the dialogue around, and I'll I've organized this so that I I'll be asking questions a lot. Uh, I'll be uh, trying to get. Um, uh, 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 answers from the uh, from from the uh, uh, the works, and uh, I want to stress that there is no definite answer. I'm just trying to bring the works alive so that we can uh, see what they mean. So uh, here uh, we go. Uh, this is the next. Uh, how, how do I? Arrêtez de partager mon écran. I cannot seem to. How do I get? Okay, Josie, can you go down oh, to the here, bottom? Here. Voila. I've got it. Okay, fine. Uh, well, here's the first work. You look at it and you probably think, uh, most probably, you think that, well, it reminds you of a child's drawing, uh, daddy, mommy, and the three kids. Uh, and you, of course, you read and it says, well, par, this is made by par, and it's called my people, uh, les miens, the ones close to me. Uh, so, Okay, fine, but we don't want to read words, we want to look at the work. How does this work convey the sense of our people, close ones? How does it do that? It gives us, uh, in, uh, there are clues. For example, besides, of course, mommy, uh, daddy, and the three kids, uh, you see that they all have uh, the same kinds of faces. This suggests kinship. They're all equally close to one another. The children are very, very often, uh, they're, they're always close to a parent. Uh, they, uh, uh, there are five of them. And, but you also see that there are five animals and the five animals well, you say, why are they putting animals there? Well, you, of course, we understand with the little one down there, with the little guy or girl in the bottom right, that there's a harpoon and they hunt these animals. But the three animals aren't all alike. There are three caribous, one seal and one morse. And they are the, the lines across them that suggest uh, their structure or perhaps even a little bit of volume uh, are horizontal, whereas the human ones, uh, the lines on their clothes are uh, vertical ones. Clothes and skins here seem to make them uh, part of the same kinds of beings. Uh, so another thing is uh, what, uh, another thing that we can see is that it's like, it's tiered. You have the children are below and you have the, uh, the, uh, the, the animals below with them, as if the children were under the protection or the responsibility of the, uh, of the, of the adults. So, uh, but it's, there, there's an effort here not to distinguish people, but to construct a group that fits in the same frame. So this is not something that is uh, childish, this is, there is, there's work and thought here. And if you ask yourself, well, what does my people mean? Who are les miens? Well, you will probably find, if you, would, if you wanted yourself to make some kind of a drawing like that, uh, what would you put in it? This is like, it, it's a bit abstract. Uh, there is no landscape behind it. It's not a narrative thing. The only action uh, evoked is uh, hunting. Uh, but they're placed on a, together, humans and animals on the same sheet. Well, it's like, it's as if what I get from this, what I understand, the impact of this on me is that, well, the, the person who, who's, they're saying, well, here we are. We are the ones most essential to one another. Uh, the, 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 the parents, the children, and as brothers, the animals who feed us and to, of whom we take care of. Uh, you probably also have noticed that uh, the two youngest the size seems to distinguish the uh, the different uh, the different uh, uh, figures. Uh, uh, the, the the two sm the, the the two smallest ones on the left and on the right are completely black, 
I don't know if that means anything. Uh, if uh, this is, this is, we don't always have to understand everything in a thing. One thing that I found interesting are those small hands. Uh, I was wondering about that. So maybe it means that he can't draw anatomy correctly. Maybe it's because the clothes are cumbersome and he wants to insist on the clothes uh, because it's cold. We know that he's Inuit. Or uh, maybe to me, uh, if I were alone on an ice field in very cold weather, I'd feel very powerless. And it's as if here, what you get is where together and being together means that we can survive. So the drawing I have showed you, the etching was made by Parr. I like to think of him, he's on the left. I like to think of him as a kind of an iconic uh, uh, icon for the, what happened to the Inuits uh, in the last 150 years or so. He was born in 1893. Uh, he lived through, he died in 1969. He started drawing when he was 68 years old in 1961 at the, the, the Dorset, the Cape Dorset uh, print studio. He had lived through going from a nomad and semi-nomadic life to progressively being sedent sedentarized around Cape Dorset. And to top it, this breaks his, uh, this disrupts his, uh, his uh, way of life. This is not easy to, uh, to, to, to receive. And furthermore, on top of that, there was a, a hunting accident at some point and he suffered chilbane and he had to have his right foot amputated, half amputated. So he couldn't, he couldn't hunt anymore. So if, if you can't hunt, you, you cannot nourish yourself. You become more and more dependent. He had to settle in Cape Dorset where James Houston, a few years, two years before had started this uh, uh, printing studio. And uh, what we see here uh, is the picture of the people there. This guy there, Terry Ryan, one day when uh, uh, Parr went there, uh, he handed him a pencil and Parr started drawing. And when he died eight years later, he had drawn 2,000, over 2,000 drawings and made a few etchings like the ones we saw. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know why, what he thought he was doing, I have no idea. I'm not speaking for Parr, but to me, uh, it, it shows what the Inuits have been through and how art came into their lives. His uh, 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 drawings didn't sell well. Uh, they were thought to be crude and childish. Uh, what sold better was uh, sculptures. I'm showing this, it will be ra rapid. James Houston, he's the one who started the, uh, the uh, um, the print studio in Cape Dorset before 1952 had gone to Inuchuak, where he met this guy's parents. This is Charlie Alakarialakinupik. He is the one who, he's the author of the sculpture we are going to see. And, but James Houston, this was a controversy at the time, a many sided controversy, uh, became a very, uh, uh, he, he engineered. Uh, the marketing of Inuit sculpture. Uh, but this is another story. This is the, uh, the sculpture that Inukchuak, that uh, Inukpuk uh, uh, sculpted. I took these pictures in the, uh, at the museum because I wanted to show a profile. When you're in front of a sculpture, you want to go around. So I want, and this, uh, it's, it's interesting because it, uh, it underlines some uh, typical traits of his sculpture. He likes uh, Charlie in, uh, in Inukpuk. He uh, likes, he swells traits, physical traits. He, you have these bulging uh, foreheads, uh, plump uh, 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 cheeks. We see her from the side. Here she is. We are going to look at her like this. What you see 
uh, is, is at once typical and not of his work. Typical is, you see, he has etched on the stone different sections of geometrical forms and he imbricates them on a vertical axis. Uh, they're generally, this is like an oval, but they're always rounded here. You have uh, the cheeks, uh, the chin, the pug nose, uh, and uh, you, you, you can read the sculpture quite easily. Contrary to some other of his works, most of his works, he concentrates on everyday situation. His work, uh, generally, he imbricates very many uh, figures together, and sometimes it's very difficult to know what belongs to whom. Here, we do not have this problem, but what I found uh, very fascinating about this, this uh, sculpture is, okay, we can read the sculpture. Can we read the woman? Can you, what's going on behind her eyes? She, she's not smiling. I don't feel her to be aggressive. Me, maybe you, it's different, I don't know. Uh, what is going on with her? What is she thinking? I thought it, I've got, I don't know if you can put words on her. Maybe it's because Charlie in a book often made generic uh, portraits or heads or things like that. Maybe it's because it's a generic thing and I cannot really identify her or know what, she, what she's thinking. But um, then I thought, mm, Maybe it's because it's black. No, and then it dawned on me. I do not know any Inuit person. I do not, I don't know how to read their facial expressions. I don't understand their body language. She seems to me, I'll say how I feel her, and we can compare and discuss this after. I felt scrutinized. She is very quizzical. I thought she was perhaps bashful. And this head that's turning to our left, it's, uh, she's moving a bit. But this mouth, I think that she's, hmm, she's sizing me up. <laughs> and if this is the case, well, it means that I'm, si I'm sort of perhaps projecting on her what I'm feeling towards her. I cannot make her out correctly because I'm not an Inuit. So there. Uh, Charlie, who sculpted this, uh, is uh, still alive. He's 80 years old and retired. Uh, his uh, sculptures uh, sold well. And I found interesting when I saw her and had this difficulty in reading her, whereas I can read portraits on walls of our uh, European collection quite easily. This, I couldn't re read her, uh, her expression. So the name Vanta Black and Blackness took another type of, uh, of meaning. <laughs> when cultures meet, uh, we're in Blackness trying to uh, uh, make each other out. Now, this is our last um, uh, work. It's a work by Henri Le Sibaner. Where do you, where are your eyes going? When I first saw this, first I went, ah, I like the colors. And then I immediately went there and then back there and like this. If you're a painter and you were working with colored materials, how do you paint darkness? Well, I'm looking at this and I'm trying to find how this guy did, but he, I'm a bit disoriented. My uh, horizon I, is blocked. I cannot, I cannot see a vanishing point. The center of this painting is right here. Uh, there are contrasts, paler white houses. This is what it says, but uh, I don't know. I'm, so I'm looking, I'm looking and I'm trying to get how do I get from here to there? So I travel around and suddenly 
this really was the case. I didn't saw, I didn't see this bridge. Suddenly I saw a bridge here. I said, oh my, but this is a river. And then I saw the boats and then around it went. And this, uh, this, uh, this, this painting is sort of tricks me by disorienting me, uh, tricks me into thinking that it's evening. And then this is why I explained to myself that this is why I was looking for light in, in, the, uh, in the painting. The colors also are strange. They seem to me to be entirely normal. When I looked at it, I liked it, but Look at them. This is another surprise here. Look at the number, the different colors there are here. There's a, a, a grayish uh, green veil over everything, but there are many colors. There are uh, uh, pinks and creams and uh, khakis and uh, blues, grays and orange, and there's orange here, magnificent blues here. I don't know if there is that much black in there, uh, there are many, many colors and they seem dabbed on it. They seem dabbed. They're not depicting the walls. It's like they're enshrouding them. They're putting it, they're, they're in a shroud of color. Uh, this I find uh, quite interesting. Uh, of course, this painting is, uh, is you can feel that it is, it has a, it, it, it's, it's influenced by uh, uh, Impressionism. Uh, He's, is known for these kinds of paintings. He did paintings like that in daytime. There's always this kind of a shroud and you always feel sort, you feel intimate. And when I looked at the painting, I was surprised that my eyes went out, but at the same time, I was drawn into myself because in this painting, I see black windows, perhaps people sleeping in the back there alone, dreaming, uh, and then, well, black seemed to be the place, a place where I was sort of more or less comfortable. Of course, if you've had bad experiences in those kinds of settings, you would not perhaps like to see this picture. But what is interesting here is that it's in the post-impressionist movement where uh, Henri de Silaner was not a revolutionary at all. He was very active in the uh, in, in the world of art at his time. Uh, he traveled a lot around uh, uh, France. Uh, he was well known and liked in uh, North America, in the United States and Canada, and also in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, he was known for his intimist style. This is, and this is not surprising that one feels drawn into oneself when one sees this. But what I find interesting in the history of science and well, uh, not science, but uh, art, uh, I'll finish on this soon, uh, is that the, the context during Monet's time when Impressionism came into being was uh, started uh, having influence was the fact that amongst many other things, very small technical uh, inventions came out. The paint tube with a metal paint tube that, that allowed you to bring paint with you outside uh, photography, another thing where uh, you didn't have to try to uh, render reality uh, uh, as uh, precisely as before and things like that. Well, those kinds of things make painters go outside. And when you go outside, uh, things are not like in an atelier, in your workshop, where somebody poses and not, does not move. Outside, things move all the time. So painters have to find ways of, find a visual vocabulary to trick us into seeing this movement. And uh, this comes, of course they tried it and they went, it went further, it went with pointillism, but it's interesting to see how all this, there is a kind of a deconstruction of a very clear, neat, image with neat contours. Everything is fuzzy here. Anyways, well, this is it. Voila. Uh, what I would perhaps uh, add is that I, I started by saying that uh, uh, viewing art is a very personal 
experience. Well, this is what I tried to share. Uh, I, I, it goes much further and deeper than my visual system. So there. Okay. Thank you, Marie Jose. Thank you so much, Kristen. Is it okay if I ask a couple of follow-up questions before we uh, yeah, we dive into the next piece? Okay, go ahead, Marie Jose. We're gonna we'll open up the floor following Patrick's presentation to everyone's questions, and mm -hmm. um, and I hope that uh, that there's already some ideas turning. Um, I'd like to ask you on a more general level: Why did you want to do this? What drew you to this series? Um, you, you've science. guided across because science. science because science and art. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a logical person, and I always say that recycling uh, as uh, an art uh, guide uh, sort of got me a bit out of my head and logic. But I remain a very logical person. I uh, passed uh, over many different details, uh, and I uh, sort of analyzed the par family uh, to death. <laughs> so it, it's the science, the fact, the science and the, the idea that we could discuss together uh, different points of views. Uh, for example, in, in, in the presentation I, I just made, I don't, I don't even remember if I said everything or even now what I said, but uh, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, we are going to talk about uh, science and art, to me, is, uh, is, is fun. There, that, that's why. Thank you. Um, I have one more question, um, and then we'll hand it over to Christian to introduce Patrick. Um, given that you had a kind of mission, right? This isn't a, this isn't a typical, um, uh, guiding experience. This is, a, this is a very different kind of guiding experience. And you're coming in with a very specific lens where we're training our attention on understanding or appreciating both the subjectivity and the science behind Vanta Black, right? Where, how did that change what you were seeing yourself? So how did that change your perception in looking at the range of artworks that you chose for this visit? It's a good question. That usually means I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, how did knowing that it was Vanta Black the theme influence? Yeah. Well, yeah. Did, I, did you start think, noticing something for the first time? Oh yes, the importance of light, for example, I hadn't noticed. Um, uh, they, uh, the, 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 I didn't say this, but it was in my notes that uh, I didn't especially speak of, uh, talk about Vanta Black itself, but the works that were on view that I was assigned to, that were assigned to me, uh, the works uh, were black. I mean, this was black, black on white, a bit of white on black, black on black, and then colors, but in, for blackness and darkness and night. That intrigued me, and I think that I understood better what uh, uh, what light means, and it got me to reread very different things on the color black. Uh, I uh, reread with Pastoureau uh, the beginning of Genesis one one, where uh, God says, "Let there be light," and there's light, but before that, it's dark, <laughs> and all all these kinds of things. I found that interesting. Uh, yeah, and I noticed that last thing, uh, one night I was working on this uh, presentation and it was night and I looked outside and I realized that I did not see the colors of the houses on the other side of the street where I had always thought that I saw them. <laughs> so it's little things like that that uh, 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 questioned me as I went along. And probably if I had gotten, if, it, if the presentation would have been like uh, two weeks from now, uh, I would have made a different presentation, but I, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Over to you, Christian.
Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Marie Joseph, for that fantastic presentation. I have tons of questions already for you for later. So I oh. yeah, I really enjoy it. I actually enjoy a lot the the just the, the different way to see the art and, and just to be guide, right? Like to, to see different details that you usually don't stop to, to look at them. So I think that's that's so always so interesting. So uh, I'm, I'm so happy that today we have this conversation between art and science, science and art. And I'm extremely pleased to, to have with us Patrick Cavanon. So uh, I met Patrick Cavanon like a year or something ago. He gave a talk in the institute where I work in, in the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. And one of the things that really struck me about his work is that he clearly mentioned in his publications that artists have been like primordial to understand how our brain works because they have discovered all these tricks that you need to do to provoke the solutions of movement or shapes or uh, deepness in images that are actually 2D. And, and that made me really think about it. And, and I thought that was extremely interesting and changed my way to see now our works just as a as an early evidence of how human beings as apply observation to discover things. And then neuroscientists, we came now and we, we just noticed that and we were like, oh, wow, yeah, this is actually very interesting how, you know, artists discover this and that. What does doing the brain that makes things different? So Patrick has been working in that for many, many years. And, and actually, I'm really happy. I, I got your, your book just like a, a couple of days ago. Uh, it's extremely beautiful. I really, really like it. So um, you're going to have to sing it later when, when we see you again for, for the science in Montreal. So let me read a little bit about Patrick. Patrick is a senior research fellow at Glennon College and a research professor at Dartmouth College. He received an undergrad degree in electrical engineer from McGill University and a PhD in cognitive psychology from Carnegie Mellon University. He has been professor at Université de Montréal, at Harvard University, at University of Paris, and currently he's uh, focusing visual attention, where he studies things like shadows and how they influence the way that we see the world around us. So he has published more than 290 articles, books, as you just saw here, and he has an honorary doctorate from University of Montréal, and he's fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So we are very, very happy to share with him some of the things that he has discovered in his research. So Patrick, the stage is absolutely yours. Um, welcome here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And uh, thank you, Mary Jose, for taking us through the uh, pieces that you presented. Um, you gave us a real sense of the feeling that the uh, artworks convey. Uh, I'm gonna work on a different level. I'm going to look at um, what artists know about how our brain works. And um, hang on, let me find it here. Ooh, there we go. Uh, OK, so you should be seeing uh, my slide, I hope. Yes, yes, OK. Uh, now, the, the session was called Vanta Black, so I thought I might show you uh, what Vanta Black is. Of course, I can't really show you the real thing. But this is from the laboratory where they developed it. And it's, um, as uh, I think uh, Stephen said, it's a, uh, a pigment so dark, it reflects almost no light at all. So what you're seeing right now is a face, uh, a mask sort of shape of a face before a black piece, a black uh, surface behind it. But it, of course you don't see the face, but if they rotate the face and the back piece behind it, it reveals that that thing was actually there. And I think the point really is that without light, of course, without light, there's no reflections. There's no uh, detail that we can see in the surfaces. Uh, and I'm not gonna go that deep into uh, the absence of light, but I will take on three different things uh, here in front of Les Maisons Blanches again. Uh, I look at paintings in low light. And so the last one that Mary Jose walked us through uh, is exactly um, a painting made under moonlight and also line drawings, because in line drawings, there is no light. The, the artist chooses not to represent light. And my favorite, of course, is shadows, where there's an absence of light because an object blocks the light. Now, in each of these, we're really looking at 
what happens, what artists understand about uh, the human brain. Uh, and they're really the first pioneers of doing research in how vision works as they try and find ways to uh, capture scenes and um, uh, layout and um, light uh, on a flat painting. So they've, they've developed many techniques that are quite uh, amazing insights into how our brain works and recovers that. And in each of these, what we're looking at really, what I try and show you how to do is find mistakes in the paintings. Now, these are not mistakes we go, oh, that's really bad. These are errors that the artists can get away with. And then, of course, the trick is find out what errors the visual brain doesn't care about, and then the artist can uh, take liberties with that. Uh, we'll see in a moment with this uh, moonlight painting exactly what Mary Jose had pointed out as well. So we're looking for techniques that work, even though they break the laws of physics. So we're not looking at how the painting makes us feel. We're going down below that and asking, what does the artist know about the human brain that allows them to express their message and perhaps express their message better because they're not gonna pay attention to all of the rule, the tricky rules of um, physics. They're going to break some of them. Okay, so the first one is the paintings in dim light and like moonlight. And as Mary Jose clearly pointed out when she looked across her street to the other side of the street, that houses under moonlight and objects and surfaces under moonlight really should have no color. They should be uh, light and dark grays. Uh, moonlight is not enough to make uh, the, the cones in our eyes respond. And so we have no real color responses. And in this painting here, that's not the case. And that's not the case, I think, for the reason that Mary Jose pointed out that this is how we feel it should look. This is how we feel dim light should look. It should look kind of greenish or low contrast. Of course, it's not really at all, but the painter wants to convey what our feelings are in this case. So in moonlight, only our rods respond and there really is no color and especially no reds. So the artist has that here because only reds are from the internal lights of the houses. And that's where the, there is enough light to convey red or other colors. And outside is just moonlight. It should just be gray, but the artist has used some other colors just to make it more like what we think moonlight looks like as opposed to what it actually is like. So here is the first example where artists are taking liberties. They're doing something that makes it look more like what they want you to feel than what it would be if you were out in the moonlight. Here's another example from a piece at the uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts. This is um, another moonlight scene, of course. And what you might notice if your monitor can pick it up is that there's a lot of green down in the bottom here. So of course, there would be no green in the actual moonlight scene, but I think the artist knew that if he had painted it in just shades of gray, people would think it was not like that. We, I think really, Mary Jose, you really had it. The idea that when we remember what we thought we saw under moonlight, we always think we saw a little bit of color and that's what the artist is doing here. So he's taking liberties because uh, the visual brain has a kind of very naive sense of physics and isn't gonna say, isn't gonna say oh, the green is wrong. I don't even see this as a scene anymore, a, a landscape scene. So uh, the artist is sort of bending the rules to make it more realistic in our eyes, in our feelings. So in dim light, um, our perception is monochromatic and reds, in fact, are most dramatic. They become black, but no artist will paint a moonlight scene as black, just black and white, grays, levels of gray. Most of them have some hints of green and very compressed contrast to give you the hint of what they're feeling. So these deviations from reality capture the feeling and that's what the artist is doing and gets away with it because our brains don't really say, oh, that couldn't possibly happen like that and ruin the painting. In fact, it makes it better. So the, the brain tolerates the violation, doesn't veto the feeling. The next one without, is an example without any light at all line drawings capture the structure of objects and don't represent the light. So, so there's not a question of vanta black or white in a line drawing. There is no sense of um, surface color at all. Uh, as the idea is that the line here captures the difference between this interesting mammoth uh, and its background. And that's a property of the human brain that the artists are exploiting a long time ago, of course. This is, this is not in the museum but uh, gives you the idea. 
So the lines generate volumes without representing the light and the outlines are not part of our natural world. So objects don't come to us with lines around them, but artists discovered that they could make these line drawings and capture the, um, the sense of the object, the shape of the object. And uh, one reason that works is because what the artist does when they make a line drawing is pick out a few distinctive features. So here's two circles that don't really tell as much. There's just two circles, no, none of one's in front of the other or anything at all. It's pretty abstract. But if I put some distinctive features in there, even just little childlike features, okay, this is a face. So now we know that this circle here is the mouth and is out in front of this outer boundary. So there's something about these features that our brain can pick up just in a flash and tells us, hmm, this might be a face and let's, let's figure out if it is a face. Let's, let me know about what I know about faces. And uh, yeah, my first guess is okay here. Uh, if, it was, if I found something that contradicted that, I would abandon it. And um, so that's the idea of the distinctive features is what's really going on in uh, line drawings. And we get back uh, what we want there. And here's an example of a artist using distinctive features to mislead you. So we quickly pick out the shoes and think, okay, that's the person's feet, but they aren't, of course. You lead up, follow up the, what would be legs and well, that's, that doesn't work. So here's a case where you have to abandon what the uh, distinctive features give you. A couple of line drawings from the museum that you might uh, try and find, uh, you know, just simple lines capture the shape. Notice there are no colors, there's no shadow, there's no light. Oh, here's a bit of color here, uh, but the, sh the line drawing shapes, and here's uh, Les Miens again. Uh, notice how the, the uh, very simple representations of the eyes uh, is enough. Uh, and uh, another face representation here. So very simple, as long as it gets distinctive features here, the nose uh, clues us in that's a face. So with lines, we find that um, we can depict a whole scene with just contours. They have to be the right contours and we could ignore the light. And they work because they capture the, dis, the sort of distinctive, the characteristic features of objects. Uh, and we, we don't, for example, find any line drawings where the, a shadow is outlined because shadows have contours, that's true, but they're not, they're not distinctive of any object. They are accidents of light. So we can look at artists' line drawings and sort of turn it around and use the artists here as, as uh, the scientists and find out what, what uh, contours in fact they do use in these line drawings that are so distinctive. And that'll help us understand what the brain focuses on in understanding, understanding the scenes around us, not just line drawings, but all scenes. Okay, well now I'll pass on to, of course, my favorite topic, which is shadows. So uh, you might think shadows, well, we don't really pay much attention to shadows. Um, you know, if you were sitting at your desk in your Zoom conference right now, but you had to walk out of the room to get a glass of water, and while you're out of the room, someone says, well, where were the shadows in the room you were just in? Well, I don't think you do very well. Shadows, we don't pay attention to them. They're not objects, but they have an enormous amount of information in them that help us understand where things are placed and how far away they are from each other and so on. Or here's an example of it where you can recover the shape. Oh, this is a container ship. This isn't the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal, but could be. But you can see the light in this case has a different point of view of the object than we do. So it's like we get two views of the object, one of our own straight from the top on the boat, which we don't see very much detail here. But the light coming from uh, this direction uh, reveals that there's quite a lot of towers of containers on the ship. Or here's one. Uh, which tells us two things. First of all, notice the distance between the shadow and the cat. That tells us how far away this back wall is. Without that shadow there, we wouldn't have any sense of where the wall was. And also notice how the cat's shadow touches the cat. That's a very particular um, property and that's a contact shadow. And that tells us that the cat is on the rug. His feet are touching the rug. So an artist will use these different properties, showing shapes and showing contact uh, to help the brain understand the scene in any image that he's painting, he or she is painting. Well, who's, firmly, who, who, who's first? Who really figured out and added shadows to painting? And that happened quite a long time ago. 
um, not in cave art, as you might have guessed, which is more or less, it was often mostly line drawing, uh, but the Romans and the Greeks uh, were uh, exceptionally talented in introducing shadows and capturing structure and surfaces with shadows. This is a while after the original shadow drawings and the original shadow painters, but this is a nice example. Uh, those earlier paintings uh, no longer exist, uh, but this one is a portrait of um, a dead person uh, on the, the, the sarcophagus, and this would have been um, a Roman uh, who was uh, living in Egypt, uh, painted by a Greek. So the Greeks technique, the Greek technique is here, and you can see the shadow under the chin and the highlights and the highlights on the eyes. Uh, very, uh, very um, talented and uh, well done representation. Kind of looks like uh, Bob Dylan. Or this one here from Pompeii. Notice the shadow of the robe. This is Victoria, uh, her robe on her leg and some highlights. So really exceptionally modern um, talents of representing shadow and light. But interestingly, all of that disappeared around 300 AD. Shadows, cast shadows, vanished from art all around the world. Uh, well, they were never there in Eastern art, but they were in Western art. So here's an example from the museum of a typical sort of 1300s painting, was well, typical anywhere from 300 to 1300. Notice the objects have no cast shadows. There's definitely shading on her robe, but no cast shadows. We don't seem to mind. Our, our visual system doesn't seem to check whether we have consistent shadows of objects. I'll show you many examples of that. Here's another one from a little bit later. Lots of very nice texture and shading on the garment, but no cast shadows, nothing uh, casting a shadow here. All of a sudden in 1425, a number of painters started getting very photorealistic, uh, especially in the Netherlands and one Masaccio in, in Italy where they would have cast shadows. Here's a cast shadow of his head over here and other many beautiful photorealistic details. Uh, here's a nice example of um, Piazza. Well, it wouldn't have been that. This is supposed to be the birth of the Virgin Mary. So this is a long time ago. So the building's not at all contemporary with the age being represented. And this was one of the most famous paintings in terms of, um, of uh, perspective, which is all captured quite carefully here but also has a lot of shadows. So let's, let's take a look up close here. And you'll see down in front, these shadows are quite nicely rendered. Here's one that crosses a um, surface, the sort of kind of pinkish tiles and gray, and the shadow is gray here and then pinkish dark pink here. So the artist knows all about how to capture shadows properly. But something goes wrong in the rest of the shadow, in the rest of the painting, I'm sorry. Um, and you could probably find some impossible shadows here if you want. Uh, I'll help you out a bit. Uh, look at the people over here on the on this side part. They don't have shadows, and this column casts no shadow, despite all these people here casting shadows. Uh, and also, there's a set of columns here that should cast sort of a zebra shadow. Well, the artist just didn't do that because it would have ruined the painting. Uh, it would have been, oops, sorry. There we go. That uh, would have ruined the painting. And the most amazing examples are in this part of the scene where the light has no explanation. The only light that really uh, physically could enter the room would be from this door over here, but it doesn't. It seems to emerge everywhere and creates these impossible shadows going up from no possible light source and nothing possibly casting the shadow as well. This pole doesn't cast a shadow and you realize and this, per this person who's washing the, uh, the baby Virgin Mary, you realize quite quickly, this person has a deep shadow here, but it doesn't cross the baby. The artist is just wants to tell us about the scene and wants to make it full of light and has discovered that in fact, the visual system of humans doesn't really check that the light is possible. The scene looks fine. It's a beautiful painting. It's a, an amazing um, advancement in the history of art in terms of perspective, but its shadows are all made up and it still works. And that's the point. So I want you to be able to know how to look for shadows in a painting and see how the artist has manipulated the light and the shadows in ways that are not physically possible 
and yet probably make the message better. Because of course, in this case, the artist did not want the uh, baby to be, to be impossible to see in the middle of shadows. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go back to some of the pieces in the museum. And um, uh, remember I said the shadows own, cast shadows only reappeared in 1425. Now you can go around pieces in the museum and you can date the pieces by looking for shadows. So the presence of a cast shadow helps dating uh, after 1425. Now look at this one here, try and guess the date. Well, it seems rather an older style. And yet, if you look around closely, and same with this one over here, if you look around closely, you'll find one small cast shadow here and one small cast shadow there. And that can only happen after 1425. And yes, indeed, these are after those dates. So now you've got a few forensic skills to go back into the museum and understand when people introduce shadows and how it tells you about the culture at that time. So the artists are placing shadows to suit their scene. And luckily, and I mean, this is what they're exploiting, the direction of the shadow doesn't have to be consistent across the scene. So here's another piece from the museum. This is uh, uh, Tibaldi. And this is, um, uh, this is uh, Jacob. And these are all the brothers, of Benjamin. Um, but look at the shadows. There's some, there's a shadow here. So artists are putting in shadows to give the scene a feeling of, of structure and space and depth. But there's no, this, is, this chair's up against a wall, so nothing could really be casting this shadow. And this shadow goes this way, whereas the shadows over here are going a different direction, but nobody cares really. Your visual system doesn't care. And the artist arranges it as he wanted in that case. Here's a much more recent case, also in the museum, where the shadow of the clown goes backwards, but the shadow of the pole goes forwards. Now, if you weren't in this talk and I wasn't telling you to look for these, you might not even notice that, but clearly the artist has made a choice about where to put the shadows in order to make uh, the scene capture the feeling he wanted. Uh, here's two, another two. This is much more, this is much more minor, but it might be interesting to you. So this is, uh, from 1905, and this is in Bas Saint Laurent. Well, you know that Bas Saint Laurent is on the south shore of the river. Here's the river, south shore of the river. The sun cannot come from the right; it can only come from the left. The south, uh, the the sun comes from the south, of course, uh, in, in this part of the world, even at noon. So clearly, the artist has painted the subject at one time, maybe facing the opposite direction, but composed the scene the way he wanted by putting the river over here. And, and um, of course it doesn't interfere with our appreciation of the scene at all to see the shadow on the wrong side. Uh, same with here, this is a nice uh, A l'ombre de la tente. And the artist has left out the shadows of these people up here on the beach that should have gone uh, away from them in that direction, but it's fine. Okay. So, so basically the point is that our visual system has a very small set of rules. I'll show you to them, I'll show you them in a moment for shadows. And artists can get away with uh, any variations that don't break those rules. Uh, well, we do have some sensitivity to inconsistencies here. So I'm three Chinese officials out inspecting a road, but it's clear they never went out there because their shadows are inappropriate. So there are some details we do notice as here, this is a real scene, but it's in Hawaii where the sun in fact does come straight overhead. And this is taken at noon, and therefore there is no shadow. But when we look at this, we think hmm, that's kind of photoshopped. So there are some things we do notice. And here's a case I did with my own head. I took a picture and then I flipped my head around and you might say, well, it looks a little bit strange, but it's okay. Even though the light on my head is from the left and the light on my shirt is from the right. But now if I do the same kind of flip within my face, that doesn't, I can't get away with that. So there's some, there are limits to what an artist can do. Uh, I could do a little bit more with Photoshop here uh, uh, without break, if there are limits to what you can do and not get caught, right? So the shadows seem to have to have the same direction within um, an object. So the rules are shadows have to be darker, flat and make X junctions. I'll tell you what X junction is in just a second here. So here's a nice shadow on the left. You can see a separation there between the surface, the square and the background. 
on the right, the shadow area, and I made it lighter and it has no effect on that. It's just even though the geometry is the same, it doesn't work. So of course we knew that shadows should be darker. But another thing they, mu they must do is they have to make this X junction now. Shadow border has to cross the pigment border, the surface border behind it to make X's. I should, it's a plus here, but we call them X's. So if all these three, thing, three things are, too, are true, it's darker, it's flat, and it's an X junction, as opposed to not darker, then we see it as a shadow. So the three rules are followed and pretty much everything else in the shadow can be ignored. It can be the wrong color, it can be the wrong shape. And this lets artists really uh, adjust their, their representation for the purpose of the message they're conveying because uh, they know they can get away with these um, deviations from physical rules. But one last point is that a shadow also needs to be owned. Well, most shadows are owned. So if it is a shadow, you know, matches the three rules, then you have to know who, cast, who is casting the shadow, who owns the shadow in order to retrieve the information from the shadow about where the shadow is telling us that objects are in the scene. So here, for example, it looks like this is a shadow of this hand. And so the hand is very close to the wall. But in fact, that's wrong. This is a shadow of this hand down here. In fact, this hand is maybe, uh, you know, half a meter from the wall, quite a bit away from it. But our impression is that it's close. So as soon as there is a dark area that is a, a possible shadow, it finds an owner and the brain then retrieves a depth from it. And in this case, of course, we were tricked. Um, as I said, we do detect some inconsistencies. And if there is uh, not an owner who's been found, then the shadow area gets misinterpreted. Now, here's a typical museum scene before the pandemic, uh, people not paying attention to the art, but checking their uh, cell phones. But in the back is a very famous painting, The Night Watchman. On Night Watchman, there he is by Rembrandt, uh, and he has a shadow of a hand here. Now, because the hand is out here and the shadow out here on the on the uh, uh, on the man's clothing is, is close by, we can see that this is the owner of that shadow. We interpret this as a dark area. Your your, your brain interprets it as a dark region because of the shadow, not because of a stain. On the right here is Stan Lee, famous developer of Marvel Comics at the Los Angeles Comic-Con in 2016, shortly before he died, unfortunately. And also unfortunately, there's a shadow cast on his pants, but it's not very easy to link that shadow on his pants to the object. So this is an unowned shadow. The object is Thor's hammer here, but it's kind of lost in the, the woman in Thor, Thor the woman's uh, cosplay clothing. Uh, so it, it doesn't seem to have an owner and our brain gives up on it. And it's not, it's not a shadow, it's a stain on his pants uh, to the misfortune of Stan Lee. Okay, so conclusions then, um, even in the absence of light, an absence of light can tell us a lot. Um, it, certainly in a shadow it does. Uh, for, for an area of a to be taken as a shadow and provide that information, it must be darker has to be flat and cross boundaries. And we see across the entire history of art when people, the artists follow those rules. When they follow those rules, they have a, a realistic shadow that imparts depth information in the scene. So the artists were the ones to find those three minimal rules and to let us know that all of the other many, many rules that are true about shadows in physics are ignored by the brain. So it doesn't have to be the correct color doesn't have to be the correct shape or doesn't have to have the consistent appropriate lighting direction. So artists discovered these rules and I really enjoy going around museums like the uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts and uh, looking at the paintings and seeing what rules artists have discovered. Uh, and it gives me a chance to look at each painting a second time. First to enjoy it as it is and then second to kind of hunt around in it and find little bits of information about the science and that gives me lots more time in front of the painting and it increases my enjoyment immeasurably. I hope you have the same uh, extra appreciation now. You know how to look for some things about shadows. There are similar tricks to look for, for mirrors and transparency. So I hope you enjoy that. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you so much for that really, really cool presentation. So um, I would like to, to offer, actually, we, we have tons of questions, but we want to listen from you also. If you have any question that you would like to ask to Marie Jose or to Patrick, you can just raise your hand or you can do it electronically in Zoom. You can raise your hand in your camera. You can turn on your camera or you can write uh, the question down in the chat. Uh, so we can we can select your question and ask you directly to, to us. In the meantime, uh, we can start to have a conversation with Stephen, Mary Jose, and Patrick. So maybe I maybe I will start with a question for both of our panelists. You guys mentioned both of you. You mentioned something very interesting in uh, reference to memory. Uh, Mary Jose say right. She mentioned about how memory would help her to think, okay, this is this object, this is this object, or this remind me this particular uh, situation. Even when she was mentioned, the, the sculpture of the Nuit lady, right? Uh, she was making reference to not knowing a Nuit person, which also is related to memory. And Patrick was also related, talking about how memory helped you to place certain things. So what is the role of memory in the way we see images? Uh, oh boy. Well, I find memory, I find memory to be tricky. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we sometimes remember things that we, we like to remember them that way and not another way. This is one thing. The memories in, in, your question is what the role of memory is in what? And for example, your appreciation of art when you see well, a piece of art. Well, to me is things that happen to me. The role, that's the role of memory. It helps me find a meaning. Uh, when I ended my, uh, when I started the, the presentation, I, I was going through analysis of uh, compositions and where things are. Uh, to what close or not one to the other and things like that. This is my, my eyes. My eyes work as though I'm reading a novel and I know the language, for example. I need to have an information that comes from outside of me, okay? And then I have to interpret it in some way, but I don't interpret it only on, uh, well, I suppose that I interpret them in, in, uh, in, in a visual sense, but uh, it, I have to have other things. There are other things in my brain. I don't just have a vertical, uh, a visual cortex. I have, uh, I have all sorts of neurons in my, in my brain and they all connect. This is what I learned that, that this is how it works. So it helps me find a meaning and the meaning is, goes further than information. Then just, I, well, this is the question that it's leading me to answering here very spontaneously. What's the difference between the information that I get from a painting, like uh, Patrick uh, uh, told us we, we get, it's the visual information. It has, it comes into me, but it, it relates when, it, when, when I integrate it, my whole brain goes to work with it. And in my brain, there is there are memories, and this helps me find a meaning. Yes, I like this place, or oops, this is very dangerous, or oh, I had I had forgotten about something, and so on and so forth. It depends. Like the meaning of the par drawing, for example, it's an etching. It ha it has very forceful meaning, even though par probably had only uh, 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 instinctive, uh, uh, spontaneous understanding of lines and shapes, but he uses them and he puts them there and he probably remembered all his life doing that mm -hmm. in, in that in that special uh, etching. He's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very I think possible. I think the, um, the, the points you make are, are quite true. And so that especially with the par drawing or with a line drawing, uh, what the lines on the paper are doing are just like little hints that open up in our memory 
an understanding of the whole scene that's being uh, represented. And the same with impressionist painting, of course, where very little information is on the image, but uh, huge feelings of space and light come from the, the, the few cues. All of that is being retrieved from our memory. Uh, on a slightly different memory point, if I could, uh, I have a, your question, Christian, or at least Go ahead. You, 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 Christian, because there are many Christians here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> your, your, your point reminded me of something. Uh, so I was lucky enough to, uh, to live in Paris for a long time. And uh, I had the opportunity to see, uh, of course, the world's most famous painting a couple of times. Uh, the uh, La Jaconde, the, the, um, what's her name? Mona Lisa. So I had a real, uh, it had a real impact on me for what seemed like a trivial reason. But the first time I saw it, I came up to him, I thought, oh my God, this is a tiny painting. How could this be so small and be so famous? It's like, well, it's bigger than a postage stamp, but it's, it's really way too small. Uh, and I wondered what kind of memory could have set that up because you know, I'd never seen it before. I'd only seen it in, in photographs and, and books. So I guess, so I guess, the impression from the book is it has a certain generic size. And when I got there, it was, it was way too small. But then maybe some of you who have also been lucky to see it a second time had the same impression. The second time I go and I think, oh, oh, I, actually it's not so small. How did I, why did I think it was so small? So there, there's funny ways in which our memory interacts with, um, with uh, paintings. And that one is a, a minor point about the size, but yeah, the, the memory is the real source of all of our understanding of, um, of a piece as we're looking at it, especially ones that are very minimalist. And, and um, yeah, so it, art is memory. You know, it's, it, you're evoking our internal memories and guiding them a lot if it's a very representational, realistic image, but very little bit of hints. But it can often be very culturally uh, based uh, for, for a, a smaller painting. So. As Mary Jose pointed out, we can maybe not know what was intended in an Inuit piece um, because their memories are very different from ours. That's just very, very interesting. It made me think also, right, how, how much different would you appreciate art if you, or, or images, if you don't have memories about things. Like, for example, if you're a children compared with someone that has lived a full life, like what will be your words about certain art depending on how much information you have in your brain already. So we have tons of questions already in the chat. Uh, I have also one hand rise that was the first one. So I will go first with the first hand rise that is from myself, but <laughs> it's from Louise. <laughs> Louise, go, go ahead, Louise, ask your question. I find this absolutely fascinating. Very Jose, you Bring, bring up everything to a, a very high bar. Thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Kevin as well. Um, I'm just curious to, to, to know, so we're tricked. And uh, nowadays, I think that we know um, with the science that we are actually um, are tricked and sometimes it's intentional or, or non, but we know that it, it, it will work. How did, how did our, our, our um, ancestors know this? How did painters in the um, fourth century and 15th century know this? Was it a known fact? Even going back to um, Lescaut, um, the, the, the right. Grotte. Right. Well, that's a fabulous question. That's really the question uh, um, that uh, interested me in following this. I'm getting a big echo. Maybe, oh, me. Uh, maybe everyone should turn off their hand. Yeah. I'll stop it. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is really artists who are, are, are amazing uh, discovery. They're making amazing discoveries. I mean, imagine uh, you sitting around a campfire outside your cave, let's say, or maybe inside your cave, and somebody takes a stick and draws an outline of something in the sand and says, oh my goodness, that kind of looks like something. And so at some point, people realized that they could capture the sense of an object and its structure and it's being uh, with a line drawing. And that was the first one. And then eventually they found they could fill it in with pigments. And then they found, well, what if we represent? So these are real discoveries of 
visual science, but they're being made by artists with the goal of capturing scenes and, and getting a message across. So yeah, it's just an amazing thing that we have these records going back 40,000 years on these discoveries, which are scientific uh, and, and of course also artistic, that they are incredible. There's no other field. That's why I'm kind of interested in vision. There's no other field that has this record of scientific discovery, which is what our artists have given us that cover such a huge range. And so these are amazing, important discoveries. Are you fair? I, I, can I add something to that? Please. Uh, um, when you're saying that they're making scientific discoveries, um, what do you mean by scientific? The, what I mean is that, uh, I'm not going to define science here, but what I mean is that you don't have to know it as we think nowadays that a scientist knows something. You don't have to know the rule to know it consciously. You don't have to know exactly. it. So these you find it, are, you just uh, find it. Yeah, the, the Gumbrich's uh, work on, uh, he's a historian of art, but not his history of art, but his work on painting, it's called the, uh, some, it, the, the Art of Illusion. And mm. it, it has very, very interesting chapters where Painters uh, of the 18th century, uh, uh, Britain, for example, find just putting a little piece of white at somewhere, it satisfies them. They look at it, they say, ah, this is, they're, they're tricking, they're tricking us into thinking. They fi they're finding a visual vocabulary. I'm using a vocabulary. It's a visual vocabulary with paints and pigments that we translate This we're, our, it, it touches in our brain, but we don't have to know about it. When, when you say they're making these scientific discoveries, they're making, they're fine. I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's right to say that uh, the guy who painted the bull in Alaska and made a scientific discovery, he painted this bull. <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely a scientific. Imagine the people who, who uh, heated up ore for the first time and found uh, uh, iron or gold and, um, I mean, these are discoveries. They're, they're no different from the discoveries now where people get Nobel Prizes for. They, they you know, take some material, they do some stuff to it, and a blue light comes out. They get a Nobel Prize for it. That's how science works. So the thing is, the artist who made the bull had no intention to make science. They had intention to make art. Yeah, right. um, the people who melted ores and got steel or iron had maybe no intention to make science, they had an intention to make weapons. Um, but we know that each of those discoveries tells us about how the world works. That's why we call it science. And in the case of the artist, what we learn about is the brain and how the brain works. So these are amazing discoveries. Parce qu'il s'ignore, it's better said in, in French than English. They're making discoveries without realizing that they're making discoveries mm -hmm. but it doesn't make it any less an important discovery in the science oh. of, uh, of, of the brain mm -hmm. Christian there's a couple of questions on shadows I'd like to tie together if that's okay um, Patrick these are, are probably fielded to you um, so first uh, do shadows need to be in grays or blacks or will our minds find a colored shadow um, as not fitting in the image. And as a follow-up to that from an artist who is neurodivergent asks, uh, who is who's, uh, saying that they're sensitive to high contrast uh, tends, and tends to appreciate the grays and close values and wonders, have you have something to say about neurodivergence and the phenomenology of color? Okay, well, the first question was about um, whether colors have to be appropriate and, and we have a lot of uh, images which I did, didn't include about um, Impressionists, especially the Fauvist. I don't know if you know the the artists like uh, Matisse and others who make crazy shadows that they're completely the wrong color and it has no effect at all on the, the sense of depth in the scene. So, uh, and we do a lot of Photoshop images and change the colors. And so colors don't have to be grays or dark. Um, they have to be darker than the surround but they can be a completely impossible color without affecting the way that the brain uses them to understand depth. So the, the color, that, and that lets really the artist be more um, 
uh, free in colors. So a lot of artists, for example, will choose very deep blues for their colors because in fact, in sunlight, uh, shadows are bluish, but they're just a slight bit of bluish, but many artists make them quite blue and, and that seems to work quite well. Uh, somebody, we have this, the impressionists didn't use black. I'm not sure about that. I haven't really made that. That could be an interesting quest to go see if any impressionists use black. I mean, they instead might be using different shades of different colors. Certainly uh, the haystack images, which are shadows, they aren't black, you're right. So I don't, and they wouldn't have been black so because of the skylights. So uh, it's very unusual for a shadow to be black. I don't know. I think Matisse used black to make contours. So maybe, uh, but uh, yes, black shadows would be pretty rare. Um, about whether um, sort of um, subtle shades of gray are more, um, well, it depends on which neurodivergence you have. But some people who are um, uh, rod monochromats, they, they have no uh, cone vision. Um, see the worlds in, in, in grays. Uh, of, well, I mean, who knows what color they have because you can't really express that. Um, but they're monochromatic um, and, and they cannot handle high ranges of contrast. So they usually wear very dark glasses to reduce the contrast range. Um, people who have color blindness are, are a different group. That's quite a frequent problem uh, with men at least. Um, and that's not really a loss of color. It's a, it's a uh, loss of the um, red green difference. The majority of cases are just have wonderful um, impressions of blue to yellow. Again, what colors they see, not, you can't get, know that. Uh, but nothing between red and green. The red looks for some of them just dark. There are some people who've had brain injuries who have um, cortical color blindness and they too see the world in shades of gray as if it were a black and white movie. They don't have problems with, um, with high contrast, but what they mostly report is the world looks dark, uh, not dark, I'm sorry, dirty. It seems that the color impressions really add the, the liveliness or the, the sparkle, the, the highlights to the to a scene and and so a common complaint of these people which and they're not very many <clears throat> luckily is that things seem to have lost their luster they they just seem uh, a bit dirty uh, which is unfortunate one one um, that we tested who was a florist of course lost his job because he could no longer tell the colors of flowers mm -hmm. So that, that made me think in something also in relation to, to the work that you guys do as volunteer guides. Uh, neurodiversity, right, is a, is a range of, of different things, it's a huge spectrum. So you will have, yes, people that have no color vision, but then you will have people with autism, people that have trisomy 21. Um, and we, we were discussing yesterday with Stefan also, in, even if LGBTQ people could be considered as the neurodiverse just because socially will act differently and their brains, our brains are wired differently. So how is the experience of neurodiverse people in the museum when they visit a museum, uh, Marie Jose? Yeah, well, I don't. I, the only experience I have in those kinds of visitors are the, the visually impaired visitors that I uh, guided. I don't know if this is relevant to your question. I think yes. Uh, among them, there was only one person who hadn't had, who didn't have any visual memories anymore. She had become quite blind at two and a half years old, and she was old. She was retired and everything. But she came. She comes to the museum. She came to the museum regularly, and uh, she. But uh, I. Others can see a little bit, mm -hmm. or see shadows, or. And they, they, they wonder about what it is, but they can, they, what surprises me of those visually impaired persons, and they were all together. It's not a visitor uh, that is uh, colorblind in a group of uh, persons who, were, who don't have that problem. They're together like that. They, they sort of make up their own images with their own references. 
uh, they, uh, they, they, people kept asking me, well, if you have, do you describe the colors? Of course I describe, I, I, this is yellow. They have their yellow and they make up their image in their mind. They have their yellow or gray. And if they don't know, well, you say, it depends on the, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, work you're, you're, you're commenting or you're describing, or you say, let's say, let's say, have you ever, uh, were you ever by a campfire at night? Very close to the campfire. This is, this is very, very orange and red. This is, uh, this is yes. But uh, on another thing, you, with the same kind of color, you use other words. I don't know, I, I, I'm not a scientist in this. A lot goes when you're guiding people, mm -hmm. much goes into just communication. And we ask questions back and forth. Well, I see your, point, your point about the um, campfire is a good one. So we all think of campfires or candlelight as very, very yellow. And of course it is yellow, but if you're in the campfire and you're in the yellow and the light, it's actually far less uh, yellow than you think. But a painter, painter always paints a campfire or a, or a candle and, and everything around it is very, very yellow because that's what we think of. You're absolutely right there. Now, actually, Joanna sent a little message What's about, um, about uh, a painter. So let me share what she said. Uh, hmm. Do we have the right thing here? Yep. Okay, so this is uh, Wayne Thibault. She said, check out Wayne Thibault. So I did, and look at these lovely oh, paintings beautiful. with the, the blue shadows here. Of course, that, that this is inside some bakery, so there's no real source for a blue shadow. Or here, this one here, all right. you can see all that. So uh, excellent point. Thank you, uh, Joanna. That, those are uh, someone who's really exploiting the fact that we don't care about really the color of the shadow. And he kind of adds a little jazziness to the image, I think, with his colored shadows. Hey, hey Patrick, before I, I forget, so let me let me just take, I will retake the point that we were talking with Marie Jose and with you about like what happened when uh, you are a person with neurodiversity and see the world differently. So one of the things that I have the opportunity to uh, learn a couple of weeks ago was about a project that is trying to help people to enjoy uh, paintings, but they are visually impaired or they have they, they are autistic people. So what this project is looking is to use in the narration, in the music or the voice of the person, different cues and, and ways that the sound will perform to convey things like colors, deepness and all that. So that say, what is your experience with this uh, crossovers between senses when we know so much right now comparatively about vision for example how we can trespass this knowledge of vision to other senses to help people that for example don't see but now you can use our knowledge that we have in vision to use other senses to convey this sensory information so what what you can say about that uh well it's, there are some museums which have lovely relief versions of paintings beside them so the blind can sort of run their hands over the relief. And that's told us in fact that you don't, you know, the painting doesn't have to have the real depth, of course, of the, I'm sorry, the, the uh, surface version doesn't have to have the real depth of the painting. Just a bit of relief really gives you the sense of the image. So there's that. But whether, whether sounds can convey the sense of the image, I'm not sure. There are people, synesthetes, for whom sounds uh, give impressions of colors, for example, um, but that's a very small percentage of people. Kandinsky, Kandinsky was like that. Was... Can you tell us more, Marie Jose? Kandinsky, I'm sorry, I interrupted, but uh, Kandinsky, uh, when he heard music, he saw colors, <laughs> and uh, he started doing abstract things and let go of uh, figurative paintings, and this is synesthetics, or I don't know how you pronounce this thing, but uh, that's uh, right. But it's uh, it's some people have it a lot, but I think that we are we're, we're, our senses communicate. I, I'm, for example, in the painting by uh, uh, Le Cidaner, uh what I saw as dabs of color reminded me, I felt, I really felt 
a, a small wind, you know, in, in the night. It, it remem I remembered it. I'm not sure that I felt it, but a visual a stimuli can, can uh, go through another channel to get to get to you to understand something. It depends. The same thing with the, I don't know, there's odors. I'm not sure. Hmm. We have time for maybe just one more. We're coming up to seven o'clock. We want to respect people's time. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Marie Josie, you, you, well, you well, have I was, having, I was having a question uh, yeah. about uh, mirror neurons. Um, the, the, those are neurons that uh, we are able to, the, 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 the brain works, the brain, we see somebody doing an action and our brain, the, the neurons work as if seeing it, they function exactly as if they were doing it. And this is sort. Of, it has been, this has been said to be like uh, at the basis of empathy. I was thinking uh, while working on these things and art. And what about impasto? Uh, this the, the dabs of painting that I saw in the Residaner. They evoked a shroud for me, and not a depiction of a wall. When I see a painting, like for example, take a Riopel, a very uh, a lot of impasto on it, you sort of immediately understand the gesture that the guy made to get, uh, perhaps you're wrong, but it's, it's a gestual painting and you feel it and it's not something, you, you, you sort of go with it. We identify with it. Is there any basis for that? I mean, it, it, I, I find that, uh, that this, uh, this is interesting because I react to paintings that are very heavily impasto, you know, heavy painting on it. And I understand them uh, physically and emotionally much faster than something like a, a painting by Raphael, for example, or uh, even Leonardo and uh, the Mona Lisa. <laughs> uh, well, you th that's what you say has a, a number of levels. There, there is a part of our, a brain that simulates much of what we see. And a lot of people think that we understand what people are doing by having you know, little models of stuff happening in our brain. And that's probably true in some extent. Uh, and there is part of our motor cortex that when we, for example, see someone kick a ball uh, while we're watching TV, we kind of feel our own leg kick the ball. Um, so th there is some kind of mirroring. Now the, those mirror neurons are in the motor cortex. And so it, it's probably not the site of all of this uh, range of empathy where we feel what has been happening. But the, the case you make of this, someone like uh, <clears throat> Jackson Pollock who's just throwing paint, we might kind of feel how they're doing it is a good one. And I, there, I think you would find, but I think you would have to be trained to do that. So I don't think any, uh, uh, the average first impression of seeing some, you know, some uh, paint piece, which is a lot of stuff thrown on it, they might not get the impression of the artist doing it. The someone who understands and has seen people do it might get a better feeling for the, the gestures that went into throwing that paint. But certainly there, and certainly it is part, the, the brush strokes, the visible brush strokes in Impressionist painting, it's certainly part of what our understanding and feeling for it is. Um, and I agree that uh, an earlier painting, which was much you know, less textured in terms of the brush strokes, um, misses that maybe and, and want, didn't want it but misses it nonetheless so yes I, I think we have lots of ways of communicating through the painting um, in the way the paint is put on the, the piece that help us understand what the artist meant yeah and there is the physiology underlying that uh, okay <laughs> Phew. <laughs> thank you marie Jose. thank you you uh you had the last question of our first colloquium um i'm going to let uh, christian um, maybe close the session. Do you have some closing remarks that you would like to make? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, so to, especially to, of course, to, to, the, to the public, but also to our uh, speakers, to Marie-José Darouz, 
and to Patrick Cavanaugh for this really interesting subject. I know you guys have way more questions. I have tons more questions to ask, but for respect of time, we will stop here. Uh, I want to invite you to uh, go to the Convergence website and learn more about the, the works that are in our tool right now. The tool is open, so we have right now the information about the neuroscience of the different works that we have placed there. And in a couple of weeks more, we'll also have information about the art for all these pieces. Uh, and next week, we will have our um, first workshop. So if you want to register for that workshop, the registration is open. It's very limited. So it's not like the, the colloquium that is everybody can come. The registration for the workshop is very limited. So first come, first serve. So go on fight for your, your position there. <laughs> and uh, in the 15th of May will be the next talk that will be uh, in relation to neuroesthetics and how colors are seen in a different way or how they activate our brain in different areas to provoke different emotions and from their feelings. So um, that's all for today. We will have this uh, talk later in our website if you want to check it again. And yeah. thank you so much for coming today. So Marie Jose, Patrick, do you want to say something before uh, we... we Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian, for putting this together. And Stephen, this was uh, really a pleasure. It was yes. a, su such a pleasure for me too. Uh, Marie-José, thank you for bringing us into the subjective realm. Um, it is the, the part of looking at art that I feel the closest to. And I was really, um, really appreciated uh, that you brought not only your perspective as a guy, but your perspective as an art lover as well and the questions that you were asking about the pieces that you present. So thank you so much for bringing uh, that experience. And Patrick, thank you for giving me sleuthing tools. I can't wait to go to the galleries and start looking for false shadows um, and paying more close attention to dates of when those kinds of things came into existence. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise and passion as well. Thank you. Oh, and thank you so all much. for being here. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Mm.